Hello, NFU community, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dr. Josh Garibaldi, and I am joined by my colleague, Dr. Hannah Lambert. We are both clinical and scientific liaisons here at Otsuka. We will be moderating today's program entitled Current Understanding of IG Nephropathy. Joining us for this discussion is Dr. Anker Shaw. So Dr. Shaw, can you tell us a little bit about what exactly is IGA nephropathy and what causes it? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here talking about IGA nephropathy. I should start with a disclaimer. If you hear me say IGAN, it, I'm talking about IGA nephropathy. Uh, as a field of nephrologists, we really need to uh, consolidate our abbreviations, but we aren't there yet. So IGA, IGAN, IGA nephropathy, it's all the same thing to me. Uh, so IGAN is essentially the most common glomerular disease in the developed world. And when I say glomerular disease, your kidney has multiple kind of components. So your kidney has basically a big filtration barrier between the blood and the urine, and that's the glomerulus. And that keeps large things like blood and protein from getting into the urine. And then you essentially have tubules, which are little exchangers where you do your fine tuning, and this all sits in an interstitium. So that glomerulus, which uh, damage to that is hallmarked by blood or protein in the urine is where IGAN is affected. And IGAN is largely an autoimmune disease. And we're going to go into this in a lot more detail. But essentially what happens is you have abnormal production of IgA, which is one of the main antibody types. Uh, that abnormal production of IgA results in immune complex formation and immune complex deposition in those renal glomeruli. And then with the deposition, you get complement activation, you get uh, basically inflammation, fibrosis, scar, and injury to your kidney. The way this happens is multifactorial, and we'll go into it in a little bit more detail, but the big picture is this is one of the most common autoimmune diseases to affect your kidneys. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. That was a really great introduction into IGAN, and you kind of talked about how common IGAN is, but can you go into a little more detail about that? Absolutely. So IGAN is the most common lesion that's found to cause a prim primary glomerulonephritis throughout most resource abundant countries in the world. Patients can present at any age, but there is kind of a peak predominance in the second and third decades of life. So while this is primarily a disease that presents in uh, youth, this is a disease that can present at any age. There is a two to one male to female predominance, primarily in North American and Western European populations. But if you look in East Asian populations, then the uh, gender uh, breakdown is more one to one. And the this is more likely to be seen in people with East Asian ancestry, more so than Caucasians, than with those with African descent. This is the most common primary glomerulonephritis throughout resource abundant countries in the world. So this is something you will see and it can happen to everybody, but the person to really think about is that younger patient. Okay, great. Um, here the slide says that 20 to 40% of affected individuals progress to kidney failure. Apparently there's a higher percentage of patients that actually progress to kidney failure. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? Definitely. So I think that the literature on the epidemiology of progression to kidney failure is debated because the rate of progression will vary broadly with the era of study. If you're studying this in the 1960s and 1970s, you will see a higher rate of progression because therapies were not where they are today. Also, the definition of IGAN, whether it is suspected or confirmed, if you limit your epidemiology to biopsy confirmed cases, you'll see an increased progression to kidney failure. And this might be biased a little bit by the fact that these are people who were biopsied for a reason, you're biopsying patients because they're more progress, they're at higher risk of progression or they've already shown progression. And then also the underlying risk factors of a population. Uh, as we can imagine, the East Asian population has a very different set of uh, protoplasm than say the North American Caucasian population. So there are some groups that would argue higher, some groups would argue lower. And it also depends on how long you follow for. The longer you follow for, the more likely you will find more individuals who will progress to kidney failure. Most of the literature here ends at about 10 years and ends in that 20 to 40% range. So it's this is a debated range, and it's likely the debate is because there's a lot of heterogeneity in how this is studied. Dr. Shaw, in the beginning, you alluded a little bit to the pathogenesis of IGAN and the four-hit hypothesis. Can you go into a little more detail here? Absolutely. So I would say the etiology of primary IGAN is still being elucidated, 
But we do have this four hit hypothesis. So largely you have environmental factors that can include things like dietary antigens or mucosal infections that can drive the generation of these pathogenic IgA immune complexes that are due to a dysregulated mucosal immune system. So normally your body produces IgA in the mucosal surfaces as part of your natural immune response. There's a part of your GI tract called payers patches, which you could kind of think of as the lymph nodes of your GI tracts that are supposed to produce essentially normal IgA. And what happens in IGAN is that you get aberrant IgA, which uh, has a bunch of different names, but essentially it's a galactose deficient IgA that's produced in those payers patches. And then your body develops autoantibodies against that abnormal IgA. So your body is used to seeing its normal IgA, but when your body sees this galactose deficient IgA, it recognizes that this is an abnormal protein and it attacks itself. So this is kind of that autoimmune element. And then the binding of your antibodies to your antibodies, so the binding of your autoantibodies to that galactose deficient IgA results in immune complexes. So you kind of get two antibodies coming together, they form an immune complex, and then that just floats around in your bloodstream. And then when it gets to your kidneys, that's where it deposits. So it deposits at that point of filtration, your mesangial cells right at that glomerulus, and then the deposition results in local immune activation, inflammation, and glomerular injury. When you get that glomerular injury, what this will progress to is injury to your podocytes. And while I mentioned earlier that your kidney has all of these elements, the diagram to the bottom left, I think, is a really great one because it shows you how all these elements are really intertwined. So you have that glomerulus, but feeding into that glomerulus is the vasculature, and that glomerulus takes off into your tubule. So when you have damage to that glomerulus through uh, basically leading off into that tubule, you get damage to the tubule. So you get tubular injury, you get glomerulosclerosis, and you can end up with uh, kidney failure if untreated. 